Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rebecca Rolls of the U.S. Department of Labor's Bureau of International Labor Affairs. I want to welcome you all to the Intro to Federal Labor and Employment Agencies webinar. First, I'd like to ask if the people on the, um, on the webinar, whether it's by phone or by computer, if you wouldn't mind, go into the chat function and tell me that you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Great. Wonderful. All right. So we're on. Okay. Before we get started, I just want to uh, make a quick mention uh, that in addition to the um, federal officials that we have present with us uh, on, by phone and also in the room here at the Department of Labor, we have guests from the Embassy of Mexico. We have Isatsu Pineda. Natalia Jimenez, and Alejandro Solorio. So we want to welcome them as well to the presentation. We appreciate your participation and attention as we share with you some important information on the four separate federal agencies that enforce U.S. laws and regulations dealing with workers and employers and the workplace in general. Our presenters are, for the Department of Labor, we have Michael Kravitz with the Wage and Hour Division, Anna LaPera with the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, Evangeline Hawthorne with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, David Kelly with the National Labor Relations Board, and Sergio Esquivel with the Department of Justice's Office of Special Counsel for Immigration-Related Unfair Employment Practices. So in many countries, as you know, it's often the case that there's one Ministry of Labor that handles the wide range of topics that are covered by multiple agencies in the United States. And that's why we do this webinar. It's to help clarify the agency roles and responsibilities to make it easier for you, whether you're a consular officer, a community leader, uh, or just a member of the public. You know who to contact if you or one of your nationals needs assistance on a work-related issue. Either way, we're glad you've joined us and we encourage you to ask questions at the end. And I just would like to say that after our first presenter finishes, when Michael Kravitz finishes, we're gonna take questions from him at the end because he has to leave early. First from the Department of Labor's two key enforcement agencies, the Wage and Hour Division and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA. While the Department of Labor has over 15 sub-agencies, these two are key when it comes to protections for foreign workers. Over many years of enforcing these laws, we've learned that foreign workers are most vulnerable to workplace violations in these two areas, safety and health on the job, and proper payment of wages for hours worked. So these laws directly impact the lives and livelihoods of workers they cover and set minimum standards for acceptable working conditions for all workers and employers. And that brings us to the overall mission of the Department of Labor which is to foster, promote, and develop the welfare of the wage earners, the job seekers, and retirees of the United States, to improve working conditions and advance opportunities for profitable employment, and assure work-related benefits and rights. And with that, I will introduce you to our first presenter, Michael Kravitz from the Wage and Hour Division. Hang on, let me bring him up. Hang on, Michael. Oh. And go. It's 
star six, Michael. Mr. Kravitz, we can't hear you. Would you mind hitting star six, please? Uh, can everybody hear me now? Yes, sir. Oh, wonderful. Uh, just to go back, because apparently I was talking and no one was here. <laughs> um, thanks uh, for the opportunity to talk to everybody here today. Um, we uh, certainly um, appreciate the opportunity to explain what the Wage and Hour Division does and, and a little bit about how we go about enforcement and outreach, um, and love to take any questions that you may have as well. Um, we, uh, we deal with uh, um, consulates across the country quite often, and so we're always happy to explain it to embassy and consular officials. Um, so in general, our mission, because every government agency uh, has to talk about their mission, um, is really ensuring a fair day's pay for a fair day's work and um, protecting vulnerable workers specifically. And um, we'll get into a little bit of that. Um, so our laws are really quite broad. We cover 7.3 million um, establishments and 135 million workers, practically all private sector and state and local government workers in this country. Um, and then we have a range of different laws that we enforce, the, um, including minimum wage and overtime, our Fair Labor Standards Act, some of the key um, labor standards in this country, uh, as well as the Migrant and Seasonal Agricultural Worker Protection Act, which is much more for agricultural workers, family medical leave, um, and um, specifically some temporary worker provisions, so the worker protection provisions and a bunch of temporary worker visas. Um, and I shouldn't mention, and, and you may hear me uh, mention this as well as other agencies, uh, that we enforce our laws regardless of immigration status. So whether you're undocumented or not, um, you have a right to be paid uh, correctly in this country. Um, and that has been held uh, um, up, upheld by a number of courts in our land. Um, and so when we go ahead and do an investigation, we don't even ask about immigration status. We certainly don't refer uh, any cases over to other government agencies. Um, so a little bit about how we're being strategic ultimately to enforce our mission because our mission is so broad. Um, we really have to focus on um, where we can have most impact. And to do that, we we don't just uh, respond to complaints that we get, although we certainly do. You see we get about 55% of our cases are complaint-driven. Uh, complaint about 45%, and this has been an increase in recent years, are agency-initiated investigations, or what we call directed investigations. Uh, and uh, this is where we go in, oftentimes unannounced, into businesses um, that we feel that there's a likelihood of violation. And we do our homework ahead of time. So we'll look at our own enforcement data, we'll look at other data that shows where common violations are likely to exist and where pressure points in a particular industry are, are most relevant. And so then we pick those businesses for those reasons. And that's oftentimes in low wage industries um, underground economy, those type of um, low-wage earners and vulnerable and unlikely to complain are the industries that we're in. Um, we do a lot of outreach in addition to our enforcement efforts um, to, to um, explain to employers what the law is so that they can comply and that workers and their advocates understand what their rights are. Um, and part of this is certainly through the CPP, the Consular Partnership Program, a lot of engagement with the consulates, a lot of uh, training of train the trainers uh, seminars that we have, a lot of um, staffing of booths and consulates, um, and we're particularly excited about Labor Rights Week coming up. Um, and I would also mention that we use the media because, again, this is trying to amplify and make us appear larger than we are since we can investigate every employer in this country every year. As a matter of fact, we investigate less than 1%. We really use the media to to get the word out about what we do. Um, again, we this is kind of uh, a lot about um, repetitive in, in terms of the industries that we enforce and what we do. 
Um, I want to talk just briefly about our investigative process so you will understand a little bit about how we do conduct investigations. Uh, we start off with an opening conference. So I mentioned that we can go in unannounced. Um, sometimes we schedule appointment depending on the industry and the type of violations we're expecting. Um, and we sit down with the employer to get some information, determine whether they need to be, whether they're covered under our laws, um, the makeup of their organization, um, how they go about recording hours and that type of thing. Then we tour the establishment. We're looking for child labor violations. We're looking for instances of trafficking. We're looking for a lot of different um, violations we can spot with our own eyes. Then we look at their payroll records, assuming they have payroll records. Um, some businesses, they may be keeping two sets of books or no books at all. Um, and then a really rich source of our investigative process is the interviewing of employees. Um, really quite important. Um, and we ask them not just how they're paid, but how other employees or coworkers are being paid. Um, and it's a really rich source of information for us. Um, we get together all of our fact finding and other uh, techniques that we have and um, get together for a final conference, um, discuss any findings with the employer, either get an agreement to pay, uh, an agreement to how they're going to comply in the future, or then um, seek other remedies such as litigation if they refuse to pay or comply. Um, in addition to the back wages, um, we're also able to get liquidated damages, which is up to double the amount, um, as well as assess any penalties uh, or fines against a particular employer for their violations. And we would let them know that that's a possibility at that time. Um, I briefly wanted to explain, um, while I went through some of the laws that we enforce, um, a number of states also have gone ahead and added a lot of these basic labor provisions. For example, there's child labor laws in every state in this country. Um, and certainly a number of states have higher minimum wages. As a matter of fact, 29 states have higher minimum wages and the federal minimum wage is 7.25 an hour. Um, and so ultimately it's the higher standard that prevails. Um, so if a state has a higher minimum wage, for example, um, then the, um, the worker is entitled to that higher minimum wage. However, we may refer those cases to the states um, to enforce because we can only enforce under federal law, not under state law. So um, we develop referral mechanisms with uh, state departments of labor and refer those when, when appropriate. So this map here is to show you um, the 29 states uh, that have higher minimum wages um, are in green there, and, and then um, there's some states that are at or below or no minimum wage at all. Um, just briefly, uh, we have offices around the country. Um, I wanted to give you a little bit of information because consulates are really a rich source of complaints for us. Um, so workers certainly can come to us. There's a, I won't go through each one of these, but there's some good information on these slides about um, information that would be good for a worker to have on hand. You know, sometimes when you're dealing with a, a day laborer that may only have a license plate number, um, you know, we'll, we'll deal with what we get. But if we can prompt them to get us some information about their, um, the location of their employer, for example, that's really important um, and saves us a lot of time and effort. So the more details, the better. Um, as I said, one of our um, effective outreach uh, to the consulates is, is um, train the trainer, where we can teach consular staff about wage and hour laws so that they can refer the cases appropriately. Um, and oftentimes they can be the complainant too. Um, so we certainly take third-party complaints from consulates, from advocacy groups, from an employer across the street, um, and here's some information that would be useful um, for a third party filing a complaint with us. It gets into a little bit more detail um, than we would if, say, a worker were calling us, um, but with some good information to ask of third parties, uh, of uh, workers that you may be talking to. Um, so that you can really make effective referrals to us. And again, here's some more questions to ask 
um, as part of it. Uh, I wanted to make note of a system that we have uh, that we launched last year. It's called the Workers Owed Wages System or our WOW system. It's in English and Spanish. Um, and oftentimes when we're dealing with this vulnerable population, um, we can get back wages for them, but then we can't locate them because they're transient. They um, move to multiple locations in a city. They oftentimes go back to their home country. Um, and we're just unable to locate them. Their former employer is unable to locate them. Um, and we are, um, we attempt for three years to reach these workers. Um, and if we can't locate them within three years, the money gets turned over to the U.S. Treasury and ultimately um, the workers are unable to get their money. Um, so we really try uh, within this three-year period to get them money. Um, one of these ways is through the workers' owed wages is, uh, system, and workers can go in their home country, um, fill in, go online and fill out through this system um, and see whether they're due back wages from a wage and hour investigation. Consular staff can also go through this and, and through simple questions can really find out whether they're due um, wages, and then it would set them up with a process that they can get the, um, the back wage check that would be due them. Um, they still have to verify their employment. Um, they're not uh, automatically just going to get a check sent to them. They have to provide some proof of their uh, identity, that type of thing. Um, but once they do, they can get money. They can get money in their home country, uh, and um, that's really one of the most effective um, components of our partnerships together with the consulates um, where we're able to actually put hands, uh, money in the hands of workers um, thanks to our relationships. Um, speaking of our offices across the country, um, we do, we have over 200 offices across the country, even the small agency that we are. Um, and so we have a number of um, AEUs agreements with all of um, various consulates uh, and um, so we would certainly encourage um, both consulates if they don't have a relationship as well as workers to, to get in touch with us. Our toll-free number will put you in touch with our local office. I would mention that um, in while um, there's always somebody to talk to in our offices, we have a position devoted to engaging with stakeholders, including consulates. And that's our core position, our community outreach community, it's got a really long title and its acronym is CORE, um, but it's basically our community outreach person. Um, and you can get in touch with that person um, by contacting, um, either going to the website or, or um, contacting the phone number. Um, so with that, I will, before I turn it over to OSHA colleagues, I will um, see if anybody has any questions. If anyone has any questions, you can go ahead and type it into the chat feature. Okay, we have a question. Michael, do you see the uh, question there? I don't. Okay. But it you says, can read it out to me. Okay. Does wage and hours see workers' compensation issues? No. So workmen's comp um, compensation is handled at the state level. Um, so each state has their own workmen's compensation laws. And um, those should be referred to the individual state agencies. And the other, another question is, are you still working the Empleo program? Oh, very much so. We're, as a matter of fact, Empleo is expanding. We're very proud of the Empleo program. Um, and it's expanding what had been in Southern California and Las Vegas, um, is expanding really the entire West Coast, as well as even um, to other parts of the country. I think recently we've uh, expanded into Atlanta area, so um, 
yes, we, we've had lots of success, a lot of good referrals that have come out of the Infeo program um, that have led to good cases. So by all means, um, that's really a very successful model um, that we have in Wage and Hour and uh, we work with a lot of your consulates. And the, um, the answer to are we going to have a copy of the presentation? Um, yes, this, this, uh, you can have a copy of this presentation. It's, we're also recording it. So not only can you have the, um, the PowerPoint itself, but you can also listen to the presentation again once we have it posted. Any other questions on wage and hour? No other questions? Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to um, the next presenter. Um, let me just say goodbye to Michael there. Thank you very much, Michael. Thanks, really Rebecca. Yep. Okay. Next we have Anna LaPera of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Hi everyone, this is Anna LaPera with OSHA. I'm also here with Yvonne Gonzalez, who has actually worked extensively in OSHA's field offices. Uh, so she will probably be the best person to answer many of the questions later. As Rebecca said, OSHA is housed in um, the Department of Labor, as is Wage and Hour. So before the Occupational Safety and Health Administration was created, there was no law in the U.S. that required employers to provide safe workplaces. So workers in the U.S. did not have essentially the right to a safe workplace. When a worker was killed on the job, there was no guarantee that there would be an investigation. And there was no legal compulsion to fix the problem so that another worker did not have to face the same risk the next day. In 1970, Congress enacted the Occupational Safety and Health Act. And that created the Occupational Safety and Health Administration the following year in 1971. OSHA was charged with setting and enforcing standards to protect working men and women in the United States. Since 1970, OSHA's mission has remained the same, and that is to assure safe and healthful working conditions for working men and women by setting and enforcing standards and providing training, outreach, education, and assistance. So who does OSHA cover? OSHA covers nearly all private sector employers and employees in the 50 states and U.S. territories. However, this excludes the self-employed, family members um, of family-owned farms, I'm sorry, family farm workers, and most government employees. We have, OSHA has a national office, but then OSHA's work is also conducted across 10 regions, and this includes around 92 area offices all throughout the U.S. The Occupational Safety and Health Act enables states to develop and operate their own job safety and health programs. The way this works is that OSHA approves and monitors state plans and provides up to 50% of an approved plan's operating cost. And there are currently, I believe, half the states, correct? 27 states have their own state approved state plan program. OSHA is mainly an enforcement agency, and there are approximately a little over 2,000 safety and health federal and state inspectors. 
they, these inspectors are responsible for the health and safety of 130 million workers employed at around 8 million work sites throughout the country. What this translates into is that there is about one compliance officer for every 59,000 workers. So clearly it is impossible to visit every single work site. So what happens is because of this, OSHA relies on a scheduling priority for inspections. And that schedule is imminent danger if there is a fatality or catastrophe, complaints or referrals from other agency, and finally, programmed inspections. And these include what OSHA calls national and local emphasis programs which are programs that focus on specific high hazard industries. While OSHA is mainly an enforcement agency, we do not only conduct enforcement, there is also compliance assistance as well as outreach. I've listed some of the programs here, so there are consultation services, voluntary protection programs, as well as alliance international and national alliance programs. OSHA's website, which I provide at the end of these slides, has much more detailed information on each of these if you're interested in learning more about them. Just one thing to highlight, though, through the alliance program, OSHA works with groups committed to worker safety and health to prevent workplace fatalities, injuries, and illnesses. So these groups include unions, consulates, trade or professional organizations, businesses, faith and community-based organizations, as well as educational institutions. OSHA and the groups work together to develop compliance assistance tools and resources, share information with workers and employers, and educate workers and employers about their rights and responsibilities. One thing that's very important to highlight through our work with third parties. This is also how we get out the message that, let's say if, an, if a worker does not feel empowered to raise a complaint or a concern, we do take complaints from third parties. So this could be family members, this could be, of course, consulates, faith-based organizations, and others. And these, these third parties can submit a complaint on behalf of the worker. OSHA also protects the rights of whistleblowers. When we house the Directorate of Whistleblower Protection here in the national office, but there are also whistleblower offices throughout the country. The whistleblower protection programs um, in the, I'm sorry, enforces the whistleblower provisions of more than 20 different laws covering private sector employees and postal service workers. The laws enforced by OSHA's Directorate of Whistleblower Protection Programs contain whistleblower anti-retaliation provisions that generally state that employers may not discharge or otherwise retaliate against an employee because the employee has filed a complaint or exercised any rights provided to employees, such as participating in safety and health activities, reporting a work-related injury, illness, or fatality, or reporting a violation of certain laws. Each law enforced by OSHA's Directorate of Whistleblower Protection requires that complaints be filed within a certain number of days after the alleged retaliation. Complaints may be filed orally or in writing, and OSHA will accept the complaint in any language. This is also true for any complaint that OSHA receives, not just a whistleblower complaint. And I've included the website below if you'd like more information on whistleblower protection. OSHA also has various campaigns and initiatives, which I've listed here. Again, on the website, you can find much more detailed information. Many of these complaints are throughout the year, and some for example, the last one here, Water Rest Shade Campaign, focuses, of course, on during the summer months. Um, and but we have we have many other campaigns that you can find on our website. 
I've included here the forms and number for filing a complaint. This is useful um, to, this is just some great information to, to send out if you have a worker that, uh, that needs to know exactly where to go in order to file a complaint. If I may, Anna? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Just to add here, if you notice, there's the OSHA 1-800 number. That telephone number will route uh, any complaints to one of our area offices. So if you don't have time or if you have questions, or if you're in contact with a worker or someone who has questions, they too can call that number. It would route them to the nearest area office. And most area offices, besides having a whistleblower investigator available, they'll also have um, co-shows available so that that way the, um, the complaint can be filed right away and they can put it in the system uh, for the complainant or on behalf of the complainant um, if you call in. Thank you. Okay, next slide. This is OSHA's Alliance Coordinator contact list. So many, this is a great list to have for the folks in the field who, who work on our alliances. Many of them, many of the people listed here also work on many of the outreach campaigns. But on our website, you can also find a list of contacts for each area office which might be uh, more useful for these purposes, but you can find all of that online. And again, here is our website, and you can find more detailed information on everything we've talked about, as well as what you see listed on the page. Okay, it looks like there is a question. I just want to make sure that uh, um, um, yes, w is there a way we can get a list of contact information for OSHA per state yes. that's available online? Yes. And uh, by, um, by region. It's by region online, by that's region right. And if you have any difficulty, just use the contact information uh, that uh, is there in the presentation um, and make a call. Um, within how many days does the worker have to file the complaint? Something like that. They can file it through, uh, well, no, they can file a complaint. I think it's up within 30 days. Um, if it's just a safety health complaint. Um, but they can file as soon as it happens or shortly thereafter. It's not really a set limit. Doesn't seem to be a set limit on the time um, for filing that complaint. Um, is there an accessible OSHA list of companies that have been found violating OSHA regulations? They can look that up on the web as well. You can also look that up on the web if you were able to hear that. Um, in the international agreements for alliances, I see 11 countries have signed. Is El Salvador a signed country? Yes, it is. How can we have a copy of the agreement? These are also online, and I'm going to give you the uh, the, the, the link to that towards the end of this presentation. And can anyone tell me how to join the conversation? You're joined. Um, seems like you're joined. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and introduce the next speaker. And that's uh, Vanjie Hawthorne of the EEOC. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Uh, some of you may be aware of us, and some, some of you may not. But we are the uh, um, agency who has been tasked with uh, investigating employment discrimination. As you see, our mission is to promote equal opportunity in the workplace and to enforce federal laws which prohibit employment discri discrimination. And the vision basically is that we would have a prosperous nation which would include or secure an inclusive workplace. Okay. Our authority is really limited to that of employment. We get a lot of confusion and questions about that. Uh, we do not go beyond employment discrimination. So cases in which there's just general discrimination in other areas, you would have to probably seek out those particular agencies that would 
um, specifically deal with things outside of employment. Our authority is to investigate charges or complaints of discrimination um, against employers who are covered by law, and I'm going to talk to you about those laws in a minute. And our role is to accurately assess um, the allegations in complaints or charges so that we can make a determination or a finding to establish whether or not, in fact, a violation has occurred. If we find that discrimination has occurred, we, there are a series of steps that we take to try to resolve or settle the charge, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and if we aren't successful, we are the administrative agency which issues what we call the notice of right to sue, thereby which you would basically have a ticket into court um, where you could file a lawsuit. Okay. Um, the laws uh, that we enforce are applied or applicable to all 50 states and territories. Um, so um, we're, no matter where you live, you are protected. And we do not ask any questions about your immigration status. You can, this does, you know, that would not preclude you one way or another of filing a complaint with us. Okay, this slide pretty much tells you where we're located. We are rather a small agency. Um, there, we have 53 field offices throughout the country, and they're located in districts. So if you're looking to file a complaint, what I would recommend that you do is go on to EEOC.gov, and you'll see that um, website at the end of the presentation. If you put, there's an there's a, um, area where you can say contact us, you can type in the state in which you reside, and it will uh, bring up the office uh, that's closest or nearest to your home. Okay, here are the laws that we enforce. Um, the first one is the big one. Of course, Title VII is the one basically which created our agency, um, and that law protects uh, individuals or employees from discrimination based on their race, sex, national origin, religion, and color. The next one is the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, and that does protect individuals uh, from discrimination based on age. However, um, the protected status does not start until age 40. So under federal law, yes, you can be discriminated against uh, if you are under the age of 40. However, um, there are many state laws which protect <coughs> individuals who are, are younger than 40, which we would defer you to um, if that be the case. The Equal Pay Act uh, protects men and women from pay discrimination. The Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, which was recently uh, amended to make it easier to file complaints of, of uh, disability discrimination, includes not only physical disabilities or impairments, but mental as well. And probably our newest law, which it is our newest law, is uh, GINA, the Genetic Information on Discrimination Act. And that uh, basically protects individuals from discrimination based upon genetic history or, or any kind of information or background. We see that particularly in, in positions in which you are required to take a physical exam uh, prior to uh, getting the offer. I want to just also make mention that retaliation is a um, kind of a subcategory, which is a protection under each one of these laws. So if you felt as though you filed a complaint or you were being retaliated against because of your race, your sex, et cetera, that would also be protected under the, the laws that we enforce. Okay, so who is protected? Um, well, you see basically here everyone, an employee, a temp worker, a trainee, job applicant, a former employee even. So uh, anything related to a job, <laughs> anytime um, you know, you're attempting to even be hired for a position, you are protected under these laws. In terms of employers, um, <clears throat> that goes the same way. Um, you know, most all private companies, state and local governments, schools, universities, nonprofits, employment agencies, labor organizations. Now, the federal government, I want to just make mention that other agencies, um, the Department of Labor, if someone had a complaint, um, we would take those complaints. However, that's an entirely different process by which um, someone who's filing a complaint, say, who works at a grocery store. Uh, two separate processes, but yet still protected. Okay. Um, now, the way to determine uh, basically coverage, uh, first of all, you have to be an employee, or you have to, it has to be work-related or employment-related. And I think I, the previous slide made mention of what that was, the trainee, the the applicant, et cetera. It has to be an employment-related issue. Is it timely? Under federal law, you have 300 days by which to file a complaint. So let's just say you were 
discharged or fired uh, tomorrow, you would have 300 days from the date of tomorrow to come in and file a complaint uh, to us. Now, if you go beyond the 300 days, um, basically you um, kind of the statute of limitations has run out and you would no longer be protected because it would be untimely. Now, let's say um, uh, we, 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 have a, uh, we have a relationship with state agencies who may have some differentiation with regard to timeliness. So we would look into that and uh, file what we call a dual complaint so that you would be t protected not only at the federal level but also at the state level. Okay. Is the employer covered? Um, now, just so you know that if you're filing a complaint based on your race, sex, national origin, disability, or religion, the, the employer would have to have at least 15 employees. Okay. The only exception to that is if it's age. Age discrimination, the employer must have at least 20 employees under the federal laws to file a complaint. Now, again, we go back to state agencies who have different coverages, different rules. Many states only require four or more employees, and we would, in fact, file that for you. It's what we call a duly filed complaint. Okay. We would just not be, we wouldn't be able to investigate it. Um, does the law cover uh, this situation? Well, it's the basis, the previous bases that I discussed about race, age, et cetera, the laws would protect those against those particular areas. So those, the scope is very narrow. It doesn't cover everything, but those areas that I mentioned are protected. I see a question, wait. Okay. Um, okay. All right. This, this is just to kind of give you, without making it too complicated, a snapshot of what happens after you file a complaint. Um, to just kind of take you briefly through the process. So we have what we call intake process where you can either come in, walk into our office, you can mail in, fax in um, a complaint to us written, and we would then draft that into what we call a legal document, a charge which would, which would be filed or served on the employer. They would be obligated to respond. So once they respond, these are various ways in which um, your, your complaint will um, take place. If you notice it says company is notified, then what happens is from there is we will offer the uh, company and the complainant an opportunity to try to mediate or settle the charge before it even moves into investigation. If that's effective, if that works, that will pretty much end the process. If that does not, then we move into the investigative process. And you'll notice on the right where it talks about investigation, decision, etc. That can be quite a lengthy process, um, anywhere from six months to a year, depending on how complicated and how complex your allegations are. And then we just kind of work through the process of, of these particular areas in terms of can we or can we not find a, a violation. Uh, if we do, in fact, find a violation, we will attempt to conciliate the case before we actually may um, try to sue. We do have attorneys on staff who are interested in uh, filing various types of lawsuits. So we will try to conciliate it. If that is unsuccessful, then, of course, you would get the notice of right to sue, which I spoke of earlier, and you could actually file this matter in court. Okay, uh, last slide pretty much gives you some information about us. You can either call in, like I talked to you about a little bit, a minute ago. Um, you can discuss with someone. If you think you have a complaint but you're not sure, you can talk to someone over the phone and they can kind of give you some information um, and in fact where you should file. You can go to our website. Um, we have, as you see, two in Spanish. We have EEOC News and EEOC Espanol. And I want to just make mention that these services are free of charge. There is no fee or anything that has to be paid um, to have your uh, charge or complaint looked into. We also have interpretive services available, so if you need, you know, um, language assistance, we can make that accessible to you as well. Yep, there are a few questions okay. there. All right. Can there be basis on this? Yes. Um, the first question says, can there be discrimination on the basis of immigration status? Absolutely. That would be filed under our national um, origin basis or status. Um, so, yes, that could, without proving it is something else, but certainly you can file a complaint, no question. Let me just take this one. How can Peru establish a relation of oh. cooperation with DOL to ensure protection to sheep herders? Is there a way to know where they are working according to the H-2A visas? Um, we have relations with Peru. We have uh, agreements with Peru. 
on that cooperation and in terms of knowing where they are working, um, that's uh, a question I don't know the answer to right now, but if you contact me, um, I can help hopefully get you that answer, okay? So uh, my contact information will be provided at the end. And then is it necessary okay. to have a contract to file a complaint? No, it is not. Um, and I'm assuming you mean an employment contract. No, it's not necessary at all. Uh, you don't, you know, there's nothing that precludes you from coming in. Only the, what I mentioned to you in terms of the time frame and the number of employees that the employer um, employed, that's the only issues that you would have to worry about. And could you please repeat the time window for 300 days. Under federal law, it's 300 days from the date of harm or the date of the violation, alleged violation. Any other questions? Okay, and now David Kelly from the NLRB. All right, thank you for having me here today. The NLRB is an independent federal agency. We're entirely separate from Department of Labor, from EEOC, and from Wage and Hour. We were established in 1935, and our primary purpose is to protect workers' rights to freely associate with other workers. Why is this important? Well, in the employment relationship, employers have most of the power. They're the ones who make the decisions to hire. They're the ones who make the decisions to fire. They decide how much they pay you. They decide what hours you work. As an individual employee, on, on its own, he, he can do very little to affect this. But by joining together, employees can attain some economic force. The most obvious exercise of this force is unionism. That's where employees join together to form a labor organization to represent them collectively with an employer. So the Act, the National Labor Relations Act, uh, establishes three fundamental rights. Uh, the first is the right to organize, to join, form, or assist a union. The second is the right to bargain collectively, that is, to have the union seek a contract that covers all of the employees in a work unit and requiring the employer to bargain with that union in good faith. And then the third fundamental right is the right to strike or to picket or to engage in some economic activity to use that economic weapon to force the employer to compromise. That's the employee's power if they act collectively. Uh, there are a number of actions employee, employers can take that violates these rights to discourage unionization, and that includes threatening to fire employees or, or reduce their benefits if they join or, or support a union. If you ever hear anyone say, if, if you vote for the union, I'm going to fire you, that's a violation of the NLRA. Threatening to close a plant if employees vote for the union. There will never be a union here. That would that would be a statement that violates the National Labor Relations Act. Or uh, the other side of the coin, uh, promising to improve working conditions if uh, employees withhold support from a union. In other words, bribing them not to support a union. But unionization is, is only half the story. Uh, the National Labor Relations Act also protects employees if they work together to try to improve their working conditions, even without, even if there isn't a union with a th within a thousand miles. This is called protected concerted activity. And if you go to um, look, look at the cases and the way they define protected concerted activity, they say that's when two or more employees take action for their mutual aid or protection regarding terms and conditions of uh, it's actually a lot easier to understand what protected concerted activity is through some examples, and that's what we have here. Um, in, in the first example, um, this, these are actual cases that, that the board has prosecuted within fairly recently. In the first case, we had a, a group of poultry workers 
who walked off the job, they withheld their services, they, they exercised their economic power to, to not provide their services to the employer. And they did this because the employer had enacted a new requirement requiring them to pay 50 cents per pair of, of gloves that they had to use on the, on the line, which effectively reduced their income. Um, and then as these workers gathered at a nearby church, two of these workers, they, they told their story to, to a local newspaper to publicly shame the employer and to make their work situation known to others so that others could decide, is this a company that I want to give business to? Uh, these two employees were fired. We took this case to, to trial. Uh, we won the case. And um, we won an order reinstating these employees with that pay. Let me give you just one more example. And this one involves um, a construction contractor out in Washington State. Uh, this contractor fired five employees for having the audacity to complain about uh, their working conditions. Uh, all, all these employees who were immigrants from El Salvador found out that they were building concrete foundations on a former Superfund pollution site, and they were worried that the soil that they were handling was um, going to kill them. So three of them took their concerns public and made a YouTube video. And speaking in Spanish, they, they tried to hide their identities um, to talk about this employer and talk about the, their working conditions to, to try to um, get group support so that they could improve their working conditions. But the employer found out they were fired. Again, we took this case to trial. Um, we actually, in the middle of the trial, settled the case with the employer agreeing to take these workers back and pay them back pay. These rights extend to anyone in the United States who's an employee. And that includes people who may be undocumented, Although undocumented status may affect their re what remedies are available, they are still employees and they are still entitled to exercise the rights under the NLRA. So when someone comes to us with a complaint, uh, we do not inquire about their immigration status because it's just not relevant to the question, was the act violated? Let me spend just a few moments to talk about the process. Um, if someone believes that their rights have been violated, they should contact their nearest NLRB office. And we have offices in most every major city throughout the United States. Uh, there is a time limit to bring these claims, and that time limit is six months from, from the date of the violation. When someone comes to our office, um, that person will be able to speak with an NLRB agent. And, and that NLRB agent will help this person complete and file a charge with us, which begins an investigation. If someone comes to us and they have a workplace concern, but it turns out it may not be covered under the National Labor Relations Act, one of our agents will still work with that person um, if there is a potential violation of another statute, for example, wage and hour or OSHA. We will help that person contact the other agency so that the person can, can go there. But if, if there is a potential violation of our statute, um, uh, we will assist in the filing of the charge. Uh, you don't have to go to one of our offices to do this. You can also ch file a charge online or by phone. I'll give you some more information about that later. If a charge is filed, we'll investigate it. And what that means is we will talk to the charging party and gather his or her evidence. We'll take uh, a sworn statement from that person. Then we'll gather information from the charge party. After that, the, the regional director will make a determination whether there is reasonable cause to believe that the act has been violated. If the answer is yes, we'll, we'll try to settle the case with, with the charge party. If that doesn't work, we will issue a formal complaint and that complaint gets tried before an administrative law judge. And that process is very much like uh, any trial or lawsuit that you see on TV. Um, the NLRB will have a lawyer present the case to the ALJ. Uh, the charging party does not have to do 
you that. The charging party is not charged for this. The charging party does not have to have a lawyer. Um, we, we take care of this. Our process is a little bit different than the EEOC. Earlier you heard Banshee say after the investigation, typically what happens is uh, the EEOC will issue a right to sue letter at which point uh, the, the person can file a lawsuit in state or federal court, um, in which case that person would either have to do that himself or herself or get a lawyer to do it. In our case, um, you cannot file a lawsuit alleging an NLRA, NLRA violation in state or federal court. It can only be done by us in our administrative process. There's a lot more information about us out there. The first place I direct you to is the web. We have a website that contains all sorts of information, additional stories, examples of protected concerted activity. It also contains outreach and, and news stories about us. It contains a description of what we do. And most importantly, it um, directs you to our closest office and gives you the, the forms you need if you wish to file a charge on your own. But if that weren't enough, we also have an app that you can download on your mobile device that does many of the same things, um, including um, in your pocket, you can have a description of all your rights under the NLRA, and that's broken down to am I an employee, am I an employer, um, is there a union here? Am I in a workplace without a union? It also, um, again, provides the contact information for the closest NLRB office. Okay, are there any questions on the NLRB? If they don't have a legal immigration status in this country, they are not able to return to work as a remedy. Uh, that is correct. Under a Supreme Court decision, um, um, if you lack legal status, um, you are not able to obtain reinstatement. And in fact, um, it also affects the back pay remedy. Um, this is different uh, than, for example, um, wage and hour, where um, uh, I believe wage and hour can obtain um, certain back pay remedies because that is for work already performed. But because we're dealing with prospective employment, that is reinstatement going forward, um, you will need to have documented steps. But having said that, um, we have situations in our office where we have employees who are undocumented, but we have um, either supported their U visa petitions, or in, in certain cases, we have sought deferred status from um, um, DHS because of in extraordinary circumstances where, for example, um, um, uh, the person who is discriminated against is essential in, in an organizing campaign or there are other extenuating circumstances, we have successfully obtained in a couple of instances deferred status where um, um, uh, uh, someone who was undocumented received authorization to work in the United States and we were able to obtain a, rein a reinstatement remedy. Does NLRB assist workers to organize? Um, we do not, we are a neutral agency. So we do not um, um, engage in the organization process. We protect the right to organize. And if workers choose to organize, if they, if they decide that they want to have a union represent them, um, we will protect the right to do so. We will um, um, prosecute employers who threaten them um, for exercising that right. 
and we also um, um, run the election process so that when um, um, a union seeks to represent employees, there is a secret ballot election where employees get to vote for or against the union. And we are the agency that runs the secret ballot election process. Any other questions for NLRB? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, and now um, we have Sergio Esquivel with the Department of Justice. Hello, good afternoon. Again, uh, my name is Sergio Esquivel and I'm with the um, Department of Justice, Office of Special Counsel for Immigration-Related Unfair Employment Practices. And also with me, well, with our office, are also trial attorneys Gloria Yee and Yena Gramford. Grambert, I'm sorry. So the statute, the statute that um, that we enforce allows our office to investigate four types of employment discrimination, and those are citizenship or immigration status discrimination. I believe there was a question on that earlier, and then we'll talk about it. The uh, the second is national origin discrimination. Uh, the, the third is uh, document abuse discrimination, and the fourth is uh, retaliation or intimidation. Uh, what is citizenship or immigration status discrimination? Basically is treating the worker differently because he or she is a U.S. citizen or not a U.S. citizen. All right, uh, national origin discrimination uh, is treating someone differently because of his or her national origin. Uh, document abuse discrimination is asking for specific documents in the process of hiring the individual or asking for more documents that are necessary uh, for that same process. Uh, retaliate, retaliation or intimidation is uh, treating someone uh, differently uh, because he or she participated or exercised his or her rights under our statute. Uh, document abuse is the one that is more prevalent. And in that process, uh, the use of the Form I-9, which is the employment eligibility form, uh, we see the most uh, unfair practices during this process. Employers must use this form to make sure that the new employees are legally allowed to work in the U.S. Uh, the employers in that same process uh, must review the documentation that shows the employee's identity and uh, legal permission to work. Now, the worker chooses which document to present under that form, and of course, it, it does have to be one of those documents listed uh, in, in that list of acceptable documents. Uh, what we often see is that the employer asks for specific documents. If the person, for example, is a DACA recipient, uh, they ask to see uh, more documents than the employment, uh, employment uh, uh, the work permit, the EAD. Uh, sometimes when the person is a permanent resident, they, the employer asks to see the permanent resident card, and, and those practices are illegal. Um, the employer should fill this form after, the, after hiring the worker. Otherwise, it could be construed as uh, pre-screening. Um, I see that in some of the questions, there are people participating from El Salvador and Honduras. I want to mention that uh, right now the Honduras TPS is underway and we've received many, many calls from TPS recipients from Honduras uh, where the employers are firing the individual or not hiring the individual because the EAD uh, has expired. So uh, 
uh, I'll give you some information as far as that and how to, uh, how to help those, those workers. Uh, TPS for El Salvador is coming up in September, so it is very important that you know the rights of those individuals so that uh, we can intervene uh, on time before the, the worker loses um, wages or is not hired because of the uh, expiration of the, the EAD. So how do we help? Um, th this is a condensed presentation. Usually it takes us a good hour to, to give you all the information. Uh, but in these few minutes, the most important thing that you want to take away is the hotlines. We have two hotlines, a worker and a, an employer. And the interesting thing about this is that if you call one of those two lines, you will get to talk to someone live. Um, any working day from 9 to 5 Eastern Standard Time. Uh, if it's something related to our statute, you get to talk to an attorney or an investigator who is an expert on, on the statute, on the law. So it's, it's very important that you know that. You, you get to talk to someone who will do the investigation himself or herself and or can give you the, uh, the answers to your questions right there and there. Um, we investigate potential violations. Uh, there is a statute of limitations, which is 180 days from the last time of discrimination, the last act of discrimination. Um, if you want um, educational materials, you let us know and we can, we can mail those to you. Uh, and you can also see those on our website. And how to file a charge. Uh, as I mentioned, um, there is an 180-day or six-month uh, limitation. Uh, the worker can file the charge him or herself, uh, an advocate, someone from the consulate or the embassy uh, may uh, file the charge uh, on their behalf, uh, and it can be filed in any language. Okay, and like I said, it's a condensed version of our full presentation, so now we'll, we'll see at the, at the questions. Uh, we mentioned TPS from El Salvador. We would like to know if you have any news about TPS requests made by Ecuador. Um, no, we don't. Not, there's, we don't have any particular information, uh, TPS, Ecuador, I guess based on the recent uh, earthquakes uh, from, from Ecuador, but no, we're not involved in that process. Um, that is totally a, uh, a DHS, Department of Homeland Security, uh, and USCIS uh, issue, but hopefully they'll approve one for, for Ecuador, which, by the way, uh, if you visit our website, you'll see that we had uh, recently uh, signed an MOU with Ecuador and one with El, uh, El Salvador. So, um, yeah, hopefully uh, we, uh, there's one TPS coming up for, for Ecuador. Um, if there's no more questions, nope. I'll... Okay, an employer can, can fire you if your dog kind of renal process is being done and what can the person do? Can you read Okay, so if the employer fires you, uh, if you're a DACA recipient and it's in the process, uh, for DACA, at this point, uh, if you don't have the actual DACA, the, the EAD, the I-766 on hand, unfortunately, there's nothing that can be done unless for any reason the worker has an unrestricted Social Security card. If that's the case, we can intervene and definitely save the job. What you may want to do if, for, if you have a specific situation, please call our hotline, okay? And then at that point, we can explore different options, okay? Uh, what can a person do if the EAD is about to expire but you haven't received uh, the new approval? with well, the same thing. I think I answered that. Um, the EADs with TPS, that's a totally different uh, ball game. 
uh, Honduras, for example, and El Salvador coming up, they do have that six-month automatic extension, and we can definitely, we do it all, all the time. We save the jobs uh, for those individuals. We also intervene, although we don't have jurisdiction over DMVs, but we get a lot of questions from workers stating that the DMV will not issue their driver's license because they are under the six-month automatic extension. We do intervene most of the time. I would say nine out of ten times we're able to talk to the DMV offices in, in different states, and we're able to explain the situation to them. We usually talk to the legal counsel there, and they're able to uh, give or give the extensions on their driver's license. Many workers uh, depend on driving for, you know, that's what they do for a living, uh, or they drive to work. So if they don't have a driver's license, they're, they're in trouble. So please call our hotline, and we should be able to uh, either give you some suggestions. We also have the good context for any other civil rights violations. So please make use of the the live hotline that we have. Any other questions for DOJ? Okay, we're just going to wrap it up here. Um, I want to say a few words about uh, our consular partnerships. And um, we're talking about not just the Department of Labor, but all of the agencies that spoke today have these consular partnerships. Uh, the Department of Labor has 11. Um, the other agencies are working on getting uh, their agreement signed. So we all engage with consulates through these non-binding agreements. These are good faith agreements between the federal agency and embassies to work together so that we can provide outreach, information, and workplace rights education. As you've seen from the presentations today, it could probably be very challenging for an individual to navigate through the complex system of agencies and administrative bureaucracies. So we found it very helpful in our outreach efforts to collaborate with consular partners at the local level. <clears throat> this is because consulates may be more likely to know how to reach vulnerable workers, and it enhances our ability to get the information out to workers who would be the least likely to report a violation. Our consular partners can assist workers with the complaint process. They can also be of help in locating a worker in their country of origin if an investigation finds that they are indeed owed back wages. And this is only one example of how consular partners can be of help to federal agency outreach and enforcement efforts. One of our key activities with consulates is the annual Labor Rights Week activities. This was initiated by the Mexican Embassy many years ago, where consulates join with unions, community groups, federal agencies, and civic organizations. And the point is to amplify the message of workplace rights. Every year during the last week of August, ending just before Labor Day, these groups organize joint activities either at the consulate or another public venue to raise awareness. So if you or your embassy is interested in learning more about consular partnerships, please check out our website. And if you want to speak to someone, you can contact me in the Bureau of International Labor Affairs. So you see my contact information is there, right here, Rebecca Rolls, rolls.rebecca at dol.gov. And this is our consular partnership website. And just to let you know that we will be posting this presentation uh, through that link, and it will be available on the home page of the consular partnership website as soon as we can get it up, so within the next few days. So we have questions. We would like to sign an agreement or a memorandum of understanding with authorities in Chicago. So I would suggest that you contact your, um, your uh, it's not clear which agency you're talking about, but any of the agencies you can contact in Chicago and they will give you information on that. Can you give the guidelines, Consulate of Honduras, Honduras in Chicago? Um, 
if you want to, if, I'm not sure what guidelines you're referring to, but um, if you contact me and you want more specific information, feel free to do so at my email. Um, I would really appreciate if you could share with us more information regarding the MOU signed between the Department of Labor and DHS in 2011. Um, again, you should contact me and I can provide you information uh, privately that way. Any other questions? Okay, thank you all very much for participating and um, enjoy the rest of your day. We will get this presentation up and send the link out. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.